Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Today, I would like to talk about the difference between a regular annotated game book and what I call an instructive anthology. Okay, what's the words instructive anthology mean? Well, instructive is obvious. It instructs you. It helps try to make you better. An anthology is a conglomeration of games rather than those with a single let's say, players. So for instance, Karpov's best game is not an anthology, but if you have the world's most instructive amateur game book or uh, Chernev's book, Logical Chess Move by Move, or his book of the world's most instructive, uh, the, yeah, the world's most instructive games. Uh, Neil McDonald has a series. Uh, we're gonna look at one of Neil McDonald's games here. Those books are written so that if you're at level X, whatever the intended audience of the book is, if you're at level X, they're going to try to give you information that will help take you toward level X plus one. Regular game books don't do that. For instance, Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games is one of the great game books of all time and it's very instructive, but you have to already be really good to get the instruction out of it. it it's not that you have to be really good to read the book, but Bobby Fischer's not trying to get you to be a better player. Anything you get at, if your rating is 1200 and you read the book, Obviously, you'll understand the whole book, but Bobby's not trying to get you up to 13 or 1400. If it does get you up toward 13 or 1400, it's more by osmosis because you're playing over all those games and you're learning some good things. But you're, he's not trying to specifically aim the book at 1200s to get them to 13 or 1400. He's not aiming the book at any particular level to try to get them to the next level. He's just trying to tell you what his memorable games were and why they were memorable and what he thought was his analysis. He's not really writing the book with the purpose of instruction and trying to make you better. So instructive anthologies are a small minority of game books. I met, just mentioned some of them. I usually start people with the easiest one, which is Logical Chess Move by Move by Chernev. But the idea is to take people, teach them things, teach them principles, teach them about basic ideas, basic strategies and tactics, get them up to the next level, but teach them by using games as the example. Games are great because when you play over game books as opposed to any other kind of book, you're covering openings, middle games, end games, strategy, tactics, principles, everything is in a game book. And that's why it's so important to go over game books. And I always tell people, my first three years of serious play, I played over about 2,000 annotated games. So I thought I'd start by reading to you a couple paragraphs from Karpov's book, My Best Games, which kind of illustrate the kind of instruction you get from a non-instructive anthology, from a regular game book. So I'm going to read you just three lines he has here on page 164. And, you know, I'm not going to show you the positions. I just want you to get the feel for what he's trying to do. After move 34 for black, he says, Much better is 34, bishop c5, where the bishop is posted anyway in two moves. White would have replied queen d2 as in the game. Then after queen d2, he says, a4 does not work because of queen b1 check, king h2, queen a2, and even weaker is 35, knight d2, queen d1 check, king h2, bishop b4. Okay, he goes through a few more moves, and then on move 35, he says, if instead 30, 37, knight takes c5, question mark, then after b takes c5, queen takes h6, c4, black's pass pawn easily secures the draw. So he's just trying to tell you what's happening in the game. He's not really trying to teach you how to be a better player. Now let's go to Neil McDonald's book, which is about the fourth one in his series called Planning After the Opening. So we can tell from the title, Planning After the Opening, that his particular goal in this book is going to be to take people who always say, gee, I play the opening and then after the opening I don't know what to do, and address that kind of level. And, and what level is he talking to here? Well, this is maybe the... I don't know, 14th book in my series of about 25 books I have listed on my website. So probably the intended audience for Neil McDonald's book here is right around maybe 1600. So I picked out a game from the middle of the book where McDonald said he was privileged enough to play David Bronstein when Bronstein got older at a place called Wrexham in 1995. I assume Wrexham somewhere in Great Britain. He writes, it was delightful for me to have a chance to play one of the greatest figures in the history of chess. Better still that the game was an exciting fight. Then he goes on to talk some more. And uh, he says, since we're talking about after the opening, he doesn't make any comments in the opening. He leaves that for some of his other books. 
but he does say it's the main line of the Nadorf. So let's go through that main line and we'll even turn on the engine at some points to see how he's going. But he gives these moves pretty much without comment. And I can comment a little bit. These are the characteristic moves of the Nadorf right here. If both sides play these moves, both sides, then you have a Nadorf. McDonald plays the old main line, which is bishop g5. These days, maybe bishop e3 or f3, followed by bishop e3 is the main line, playing what's called an English attack. e6, f4, and now bishop e7 is the main move. Bronstein plays knight bd7. After knight bd7, you could consider not transposing into the main line with queen f3, but rather playing something like bishop c4. But I think queen f3 is as good as anything. Let's ask the engine. The engine doesn't have a database on it, so he'll give me his unbiased opinion. And he says, yeah, white should transpose with queen f3. All right, we'll leave that on on the bottom there. All right, so queen f3 was played in the game. Queen c7, castle queen side, bishop e7. Now we've transposed back into the main line. And now white has a choice between the Velimirovich line with bishop d3 or g4 for white, which is the still the main line. Stockfish says g4 or even the rare f5 are the best moves. Um, when I used to play the Nadorf, I used to see this all the time. I have many games in my database where white played g4. I didn't play against bishop d3 quite as often. All right, so anyway, back to the main line, g4. And now black plays b5, threatening in some lines to play b4 and drive the knight away. White decides to get out of the way of the g-pawn. He plays bishop takes f6. You might think that taking back here with the bishop and hitting the knight is the right idea. But if you take with the bishop, it leaves this pawn hanging. And now white can sacrifice bishop takes b5. A takes b5, knight takes b5, queen a5, knight d5, d6 check. And if king e7, then e5, hitting the bishop, bishop h4, rook d4, stockfish says, and white is winning. So back to the game. So the main line is to take with the knight, and of course that's what Bronstein did. White hits the knight, the knight goes back to d7. And now the old main lines are to play f5, and then black plays knight c5. But after f5, Stockfish doesn't like knight c5. If we play f5, and when this game was played in 1995, the engines weren't quite that good, and the move that Stockfish is suggesting, which would have been a shock if I had played this move way back when I was playing, castling right into the pawn storm, letting white play something like rook g1 or f6. It would have been unthinkable almost to castle here, unless you had seen it done in Grandmaster games. But I'm sure now, with the engine saying it's the best move, that if we look in the database, there's probably more and more games played where black actually does castle here if he wants to try to defend the position. We can see white has a normal opening advantage in a Sicilian of about 0.4 pawns. This is the part of the game where McDonald starts annotating. So after f5, he says, trying to undermine the hedgehog center in the same style as Kramnik versus Chumachenko, which is an earlier game in the book. It is essential that the black pawn stands its ground on e6, as if, if black should now play a move like e5, then knight d5, the white knight jumps into the hole at d5 with a big attack looming. <clears throat> After the game, Bronstein suggested maybe white could try the interesting move h4, keeping the g5 pawn as an, as an alternative. Of course, we're still very much in the territory of opening theory. All right, so f5, very, very common move. <clears throat> and as I said, in the old days, knight to c5 here was pretty automatic. And that's what I would always play. The engine says castle. Bronstein, of course, is pretty strong engine here. He knew knight c5 was the main move, but he decided to play the brown system. Bishop takes g5 check. Now, listen to McDonald's comment in the book. Again, a, a different than the kind of comments you saw from Karpov in the other book. <clears throat> he says, Black plans to castle kingside and so eliminates the g5 pawn in order to break up the advancing phalanx of white pawns. He is also providing his bishop with a safe dark square base on f6 to complement the knight's one on e5. And besides these technical niceties, he's also grabbing a pawn with check. White plays king b1. 
And again, McDonald's trying to teach you. So even though that move is pretty forced, he does comment and he says, White retreats his king into safety and forces Black to attend the threat on e6. Of course, he doesn't care about losing a pawn or control of a couple of dark squares if he can bash Black on the light squares after conquering the e6 point. Black now plays knight e5. McDonald says, economical defense. The knight takes up its strong post and hits the white queen. Queen h5, pinning the f7 pawn. Now threatening f takes e6, and black can't recapture. Bishop takes e6 because knight takes e6, and the pawn on f7 is pinned. McDonald says, consistent with the theme of pressuring the e6 pawn, the queen hounds the bishop and at the same time pins the f7 pawn. He says, if now black should try to save the bishop with bishop f6, then knight takes e6, bishop takes e6, f takes e6, and now white's going to hop in with knight to d5 with a big advantage. Okay, back to the game. In the game, black still has to save the bishop. Stockfish suggests that bishop f6 is the best move. Bronstein plays queen e7, and now... Stockfish says that McDonald should play knight takes e6. Even though the queen and the bishop are both guarding it. So, McDonald says rook to g1, gaining time to bring his rook in the game by attacking the bishop a second time. Well, McDonald wrote this book in the year 2007. So, his engines were probably strong enough to tell him that knight takes e6 was a better move. But maybe not. You know, it's hard to tell. But knight takes e6 is number one. His gives him an advantage of about 0.9. His move rook to g1 gives black an advantage of about minus 0.2. So white loses a little over a pawn by not playing his best move knight e6. But that's not in the book. That's me. And now Bronstein, after rook g1, should play bishop f6 with a slight advantage. He plays h6. Stockfish says, eh, it's okay, not quite as much an advantage. So that move does not deserve a question mark. If the evaluation on bishop f6 is minus 0.6, and the evaluation after h6 is minus 0.4, then it's not the best move, but it doesn't deserve a question mark. In the book, McDonald gives it a question mark. And he says, Bronstein maintains the bishop on g5 square so that the black queen and rook on f8 will be able to un utilize the f-file in what follows without having their view obstructed by the bishop on f6. However, the idea doesn't seem quite good enough, and so black should prefer the more solid f6, bishop f6, when he gives a line. Okay, now Bronstein has allowed f takes e6. And McDonald does play the best move. He says, I may have been surprised by Black's last move, but fortunately I wasn't shocked enough for fall to fall for knight takes at e6 when Black can play g6 and, and white will just lose the knight. The game move wins back the pawn as after bishop takes e6, I can play knight f5. So therefore, Black has to play first the Zwischenzug g6, which he gives an exclamation point. White now gets to take the pawn with check before he saves the queen. Stockfish actually suggests that you shouldn't do that. You should just play queen h3 and let him take the pawn. White plays e takes f7 check. Queen takes f7. Black's a little better. Queen e2 best move. And now black should castle, and he does. And now there's a very long set of comments by McDonald trying to teach you about what's happening here. It's sort of like the point of the game where you sit back and you kind of get an idea of what your plan should be, try to evaluate the position. So let me read what he says. Again, this is why you buy instructive anthology books when you're trying to improve. <clears throat> he says it's time to take stock. White has broken up the hedgehog center and as a consequence has the d5 square for his knight. His other knight is well centralized on d4. His rooks are both on semi-open files and could target the loose pawns on d6 and g6 in the future, though there are obstacles in their path. In this respect, the white knight on d4 is just as much of a nuisance for the rook on d1 as the black knight is for the rook on g1. The white king is safe, much more so than the black king. So far, this is all pretty good for white. But we become more pessimistic when we look at the bishop at f1. One of the fundamental aims of white's strategy in removing the black pawn on e6 was to increase the scope of his light-squared bishop 
so it's rather depressing to see it sitting passively on F1. Furthermore, Black is threatening to use his control of the F-file to force White into a most unwelcome exchange of queens with queen F2 exclamation point. Then the safety of the Black King ceases to be an issue, and he has some important positional advantages. A dark square bishop with no rival, because White gave up his own bishop with bishop F6, and control of the open file with his rook, which could well invade on F2 at some point on, to attack the weakling on H2. Black's 2 to 1 kingside pawn majority would find it easier to create a passed pawn than White's 3 on 2 majority in the queen side. In order to prevent the draining of the dynamism from his position with the queen exchange, White decided he had to do something drastic to stop queen f2, and so he plays knight f5 exclamation point. Okay, while we were talking, the engine was looking, and the engine found h4 over here as White's best move with minus 0.46. After knight f5, engine says black should just play king h7 with about a, almost a one pawn advantage. Bronstein decides to take the knight. Stockfish says black's still a little better but not as much as before. h4, now Bronstein finds the best move, f4. McDonald gives that an exclamation point and he says an excellent repost. Repost. First of all, what is stopped from playing e takes f5 when after bishop g2 is Bishop would enjoy a long open diagonal. Instead, the bishop remains inert. Also, after e takes f5, the white knight would gain the e4 square. Secondly, black creates a passed pawn, which will prove a key asset for the rest of the game. And thirdly, prepares the defensive maneuver, which occurs next move. All right, so h takes g5, getting the piece back. And now Bronstein plays the Zwischenzug, bishop g4. <clears throat> well, that doesn't look safe. It looks like white can play rook takes g4, knight takes g4, queen takes g4. And if he could do that, that would be a massive advantage for white to get two pieces for a rook. Let's play it and show you what I mean. Right now, black has a minus 0.8 advantage if he plays it perfectly. Let's say he just takes back. Look at that. White is up by six pawns. So that's not black's idea. Black's idea was not to give up a bishop and a knight for a rook. Because if he did that, the game would be over. White would just win with his two pieces versus the rook. I know the Reinfeld values tell you that a rook's worth five and a bishop and a knight are worth three, and three and three versus five is only winning by one pawn. But actually, the difference is much greater than that because the Reinfeld values are not correct when it comes to things like that. And you can see in this particular position, if White would give up that rook for the knight and the bishop, he, he would go from being down 0.8 to up seven pawns here in this position. That's how bad it would be if that happened. Well, of course, Bronstein was not planning to do that. White did play rook takes here, but now black has his Vishenzug, which he has to play. F3, removing the guard of the queen on the knight. So what's happening is white's actually sacrificing the exchange to open up the black king. So F3 is forced. Now it's the engine suggests white should play queen to h2. McDonald played queen to d2. Stockfish says that's a pretty big mistake. Now white's down about two pawns. Of course, knight takes g4 to get his material. He says a very different type of game would have been played if white hadn't played rook takes g4. He says the right move was g takes h6. He should have played here to pin the knight to the king, bishop to the king. If the king gets out of the pin with king h8, queen to g2, f3, obviously the queen can't take the bishop. Queen f2 blocking here. And now McDonald would have had compensation. And he would have been 0, 0, 0 if he had found this line. And he criticizes himself in the book and says rook takes g4 was a really bad move. All right, back to the game. So rook takes g4, f3, queen d2, knight takes g4, g takes h6. White's trying to play by opening up the black king and as compensation for his exchange. He says, I'm now threatening to win the knight with queen g5 check. Bronstein says, oh, I'm up the exchange and I have a passed pawn. Would you like to trade queens? White says, no. And his comment is, White cheers himself up by threatening mate in one. Bronstein, of course, is not going to fall for mate in one. He says, thank you for the pawn. White says, how about if I pin the knight? Bronstein says, I'll guard it. Stockfish says, guarding it with the queen on f4 was better than guarding it with the queen on h4. Um... McDonald doesn't mention that. He just 
says queen h4, defending the knight and not giving white a chance to do anything with bishop h3. Stockfish says, I'm not worried about bishop h3. If bishop h3 here, he counterattacks the queen with f2. If white saves the queen, black plays rook here. And now white can't really win this piece without allowing black to get a queen. So this is kind of hopeless. Black's up by five pawns. All right, back to the game. So Black did play queen h4. White decides to break up the queen side with a4. Stockfish says with perfect play, black should be winning. Now the engine gives f2. Bronstein goes out of the way with king h8. That's not his most accurate. McDonald plays his best move, queen d4 check. Queen f6. Now the engine suggests that white should just repeat the position. White throws a pawn at black to see what black will do. e5. Brunstein plays the best move, queen f4, offering again a trade. McDonald says, all right, I'll take the pawn. Here the engine suggests rook fd8. Brunstein plays rook ad8. Stockfish says, all right, well, if you take it that way, at least I can take the pawn. Now he says, hmm, that doesn't seem to work either. So he decides to give up the queen for two rooks, but the queen and the knight are a very good combination. And this pass pawn on f3 is a monster, and this pawn on e5 is, is pretty weak. So he gives the next couple moves without comment. King g7, a takes b5, a takes b5, rook d7 check. King h6, e6. Queen e5, best move, black's up by about two e7. Now, he, now the engine gives queen e1 check first. And if white plays, well, if he plays rook d1, then clearly queen takes e7. If he says, go ahead and take my bishop because I'll get a queen and plays there, Stockfish gives queen e6 check, winning the rook. So he's he's got problems. If he plays knight d1, then knight f6 stops the pawn from queening, threatens the bishop, and also threatens the rook. So this should be winning. All right, back to the game. So black plays knight f6 first. Rook goes back to d3. Pawn f2. Knight d1. He's trying to win that pawn. He would love to trade this pawn for this pawn and get pawns on only one side of the board. That would make it a lot easier to draw with a rook and a piece and a pawn against a queen. Again, checking those Reinfeld numbers, a rook and a bishop and a pawn versus a queen is 9 to 9. But actually in this position, the queen is worth more. It has double attacks, and especially if white can't win that pawn on f2, it's going to be a real thorn there. All right, so black Stockfish says black should play queen e7 here. And he does. White can't take the pawn now. If he takes the pawn, then rook check, queen check wins material. So he first hits the queen, and the queen goes to c5, and now the knight still can't take the pawn because of the rook there. And if the rook checks, then the king is going to come up, and the queen will be guarding the pawn. All right, so after queen c5, white plays bishop d3, knight g4, rook g3, trying to hit the knight and take block the king out of the game. McDonald says here, I thought I might be escaping because the black king can't become active. If he plays king h5 or king g5, I can play bishop e2, pinning the knight. But I hadn't recognized with the kind of move that won Bronstein in interzonal, a candidates tournament, two Soviet championships, and very nearly a world title. The engine says Bronstein should play queen d4. Bronstein plays queen e5, threatening the e1 square and the rook if the rook takes the knight then the pawn can come up and queen. Let's show you. Rook takes. Well, first queen e1. If king c1. Queen g1. Wow. That's not what he was threatening. All right, let's take a look at this. Um, oh, I see. So Stockfish's move, queen d4, works, but Bronstein's move doesn't work. Queen e5. So obviously he didn't check that with so he says here, if rook takes g4, then f1 queen, bishop takes, 
Queen e1. Oh, he... Oh, I see. I made the move. I said queen e5. My bad. He played queen d5, not queen e5. No wonder it doesn't work. I was so busy reading the uh, book where it said uh, queen d5 and seeing that Stockfish says queen d4 that I put the queen on the wrong square. All right, apologize for that. But queen d4 does work and wins the game for the reason you'll see also in the game. Knight e3. If he plays rook takes, then simply pawn up queen, bishop takes, queen takes knight, wins the bishop. Okay, so queen d5, good move. Knight e3, knight takes e3, rook takes e3, but now that damaging pawn is staying on the board. Black plays king g5, it gives an exclamation point, Stockfish agrees. And McDonald explains that now queen takes d3 is not a good move. He says if he had played queen d3 instead and rook takes d3, f1 queen, king a2, and white might hold the draw because he has a fortress where he's just going to move his king back and forth or his rook back and forth and guard these pawns, and it'd be hard for black to ever get the king into the game. So this would make it hard for black to win. So that would be kind of a bad sacrifice to make things harder. So instead, after rook takes... King g5, just holding on to his pawn. King c1. King f4. And now white should try rook e8. That's his best move. But black can now play queen takes d3, c takes d3. f1 queen. King d2. And there's, the fortress isn't intact here. With this pawn, this pawn is soon going to be lost. Stockfish gives queen g2 check, and you can see it's up at plus 7. So this, this would not be nearly as good, but it was worth a try. Instead, in the game, white plays rook to h3, and black plays queen to e6, threatening queen takes h3 and queen e1 check, and there's no defense to both. For instance, if rook checks, King to g3, hits the rook. If the rook finally goes back to the back rank, queen checks, hits the rook. And, of course, if rook takes, pawn takes, the bishop is no match for the queen. Mate. The rook has a chance to uh, to get a uh, fortress. We're assuming it's not made, of course, which it is. But the, the rook would have a chance to get a fortress if that was the material, as we saw when the king was on a2. But with the bishop, there's no chance, even if it wasn't made. All right, so after... Black played queen e6. McDonald resigned. McDonald says, This is a great game by Bronstein, who told me the next day that he had sat up the whole night analyzing its complexities. Okay, so that's an instructive anthology. Let's show you my instructive anthologies on my website. If we go to danheisman.com, bring that over so you can see it. You go to more. You go to recommended book lists, not recommended books. The first list is the basic tactics books. I just added the new book, uh, Everyone's First Chess Workbook by Giannatos to my recommended basic tactics set. Really good book by Fide Master Giannatos. Also a chessable course. Game collections, recommended instructive game anthologies in roughly ascending order of difficulty. Starts out with Logical Chess Move by Move, the world's most instructive amateur game book. Chess, The Art of Logical Thinking by McDonald. Note the non-anthology of First Book of Morphe by Del Rosario can be read around this level. Simple Attacking Plans by Wilson. Notice you want to read as many different authors as you can. The Most Instructive Games of Chess Ever Played by Chernov again. Art of Planning and Chess by McDonald. Winning Chess Brilliancies by Sirwan. Chess Master vs. Chess Amateur by Uva, Uva and Maiden. Best Lessons of a Chess Coach by Vera Montri and Yuseta. Yeah, sorry, Yusebi. 50 Essential Chess Lessons by Steve Giddens. So look at all those different authors. We've got Chernev, me, McDonald, um, Del Rosario, Wilson, uh, Sirawan, Owa, Maiden, Vera Montri, Eusebi, and Giddens. You want to read as many different authors as you can. They all have specific things they like to emphasize to you and what they really want to teach you. You want to have a lot of these people creating your chess conscience of whispering in your ear so reading these instructive anthologies is going to be very, very helpful. 
All right, thanks for tuning in. If you uh, have not subscribed to the channel, great. If you like the video, thanks. And lastly, please tell your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.